is a photograph of Catherine Eddowes taken in the mortuary and I was looking through a Sickert art book and I came across this painting called Le Journal and the first thing that struck me about it is what a strange painting what a strange posture for this woman to be in. she's way thrown back I mean who reads a newspaper way up here she's leaning over the back of a couch and also this choker of pearls around her neck is very atypical for anything I've seen in any other secret paintings. And what it struck me is like a negative of beads of blood, like symbolic of that. And then there's a ripper letter which later on says, did you like the pretty necklace I gave her? And in those days, you know, when they referred to a cutthroat sometimes as a necklace. And then I went back and looked at this photograph because it reminded me of that. And I thought the similarity between the two was really frightening. I knew I was going to set myself up to be shredded by people, critics, uh, all those people who've studied Jack the Ripper all their lives, people who worship Walter Sickert, but the more you know about him, the more you can see that he would be a perfect suspect or individual to have committed these crimes and have gotten away with them. I found out that he was born in Germany and came to London as a little boy for an operation in 1865. As a young adult, he worked first as an actor and then as an assistant to the American painter Whistler. Once independent, he became infamous for his intense and vibrant depictions of low-life music hall scenes and later a series of nudes in seedy bed-sitting rooms, which to me are both chilling and terrifying, with women who look dead. He was a restless and volatile man, with numerous addresses in secret studios. He moved with consummate ease from bohemian salons to the drawing rooms of the British establishment. Sickert was a remarkable individual, uh, an extraordinarily larger-than-life character. And because of that, the many people who knew him, even in his lifetime, particularly towards the end of his life, recorded his astonishingly witty and amusing conversation, his personal eccentricities, also sometimes the rather unattractive sides of his character. He was outstanding in a rather drab era. But I think he left us subtle clues in his paintings and that if we look and look again, we can see into his Jekyll and Hyde character. This is one of the most important pictures by Sickert that we have. Uh, this is Henri Borden. A lot of people can relate to that, I'm sure. Let me ask you something. How far away did Sickert stand from a canvas when he painted? Because I'm trying to see what he saw. I mean, I think with something on this scale, it would be a mixture of, of working close up and then, then having to up. step back to see the more general effects. Right. I think the main point of this painting is about the relationship between the two figures, about the man and his wife. Um, oh, absolutely. And it's about people who have nothing left to say to each other. She's so bored. It's... She's staring at them stuffed birds. I mean, you've got this magnificent artistic talent. You can feel the tension there, the boredom. And I mean, there's an energy there, a bad energy between this couple. I mean, I can feel that. But then yet there's this thing up here, just something that I noticed that stopped me in my tracks. There's a strange pale sort of crescent that's coming out over her left shoulder from what looks like the darkness. And if you stand back, and again, he says, is this my imagination? To me, it looks like it could be almost a figure coming behind her. I must say, looking at that, I can see what you mean, but it doesn't really look like that to me. Uh, it, it looks to me like a reflection or a shadow. I'm not saying that's what it is, because it's like interpreting an ink yeah. blot. The other thing I noticed is this bottle of what looks like it'd be claret or something. Unless someone had just poured it the way it's sort of trailing down the glass here, to me, who's as an aficionado of crime as opposed to art, it has a sort of bloody, bleeding sort of look. 
This is Sickert in the 1920s, and this is called The Servant of Abraham. It's a self-portrait. And again, as so often with his pictures, it's in character. It's a self-portrait, mm -hmm. but he's actually adopting the persona mm -hmm. of a biblical character. Which is interesting. There's actually no other evidence for him being the servant. So why do you think he called it that? Other than the title. I think Sickert is, is fascinated by ambiguity and the nature of our perception of, of what we think we're seeing and how he can play with that. The more I investigated, the more I believed there was something truly bizarre about Sickert. When I visited my old friend, Ed Salzbach, who worked for many years as a psychological profiler for the FBI, we reviewed the personality traits of a violent psychopath. They can be extremely intelligent, some of them extraordinarily intelligent. Also articulate. They have good command of the language. They're extraordinarily manipulative. They can hit your buttons faster than you can believe. Their hallmark is no conscience. They can do anything as grotesque as putting a woman's bowels on her night table. And you or I would look at this and say, my God, what kind of person would do this? They'll do it. And they have a uh, extremely large ego. They, they view themselves as some sort of Superman. They're convinced they're smarter than everybody else. And they love to prove it. They love to rub your nose in it and so on. This psychopathic personality generally flowers somewhere between the uh, mid-20s to late 40s, early 50s. What you want to find in order to tie the murders together is signature stuff. That's the stuff that appeals to his innermost being. What would be Jack the Ripper's signature? The wound to the throat, uh, the throttling of the victim, the evisceration, this interest in, in what's inside a woman, let's say. One of the things I would look for is for this killer to certainly not have stopped at five. These guys will keep going until they're caught or killed or put away for something else. As I continued to study his paintings and investigate the Ripper case, I became convinced that Mary Kelly was not his last victim. there were other murders in London and elsewhere which shared horrific similarities with the Ripper crimes, but the police never attributed them to him. It seemed to me as if people were determined to believe this serial killer had vanished. I looked at one particular murder of a prostitute in Camden Town, very close to Sickert's lodgings, and found the similarities frightening. And then I was shown a series of paintings by Walter Sickert chronicling this very murder. This image actually called the Camden Town murder depicts a lifeless woman on a bed. Her face is turned to a wall and one can only imagine what has just happened. In another powerful and moving painting, a man contemplates a writhing naked woman on a bed. In yet another, a woman appears prone and defenseless from the predatory male staring at her. I believe Sickert committed the Camden Town murder and then used it as an excuse to depict a series of violent and pornographic pictures that relate not only to this victim, but to all of his killings. He never, it seems to me, actually pins down in any single picture he painted.